about um, opera and archaeology. Um, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> whatever you want, Peter. <laughs> Not that I want to look like I haven't prepared. But, um, the, um, uh, with, um, in collaboration with the, uh, the National Museum of Wales and Gwerth for Cymru, um, we've created two operas recently, which I think I, I touched on in the, uh, the lunchtime session. Um, one of them, uh, constructed in 2012 to 13, um, was about the Irish Cranog in Llangors Lake. Uh, which was excavated um, by uh, Mark Redknapp, who's sitting over there in Allen Lane. Um, and it's Wales's only Irish Cranog, so we decided that we would explore that um, and create an opera. Um, we've also worked recently at The Archaeologist's Wife, which is very different and about the um, excavation at Caroleon of the museum, as I mentioned this morning. Um, what I was hoping to talk about is the different way in which both those projects worked with archaeologists and worked with um, uh, the heritage sector. Both operas are pasticcio operas, which means that we've taken a, a composer um, and the, we've taken some of their scores and cut and pasted them together, pasticcio meaning like a pasty rather than a pastiche. <laughs> so it's been, um, we've um, cut and pasted the score together and then put a new libretto on top of the existing score. So, um, and the squidder um, about the Irish uh, Cranog um, was the music of Handel. And we took music from about three of Handel's operas. Um, Handel's operas go um, uh, an aria, bit of recitative, aria, bit of recitative. So it's incredibly easy to edit it. So we decided that we could, um, we had a lot of flexibility in how we would create that opera. Uh, the Archaeologist's Wife um, is, as I mentioned this morning, is about Tessa Wheeler, a very anxious lady, um, facing a lot of different pressures. Um, and we wanted music that reflected her anxiety. She died young. Um, she had uh, stomach pains, so gastric problems, which can be a symptom of chronic anxiety. So we chose the music of Shostakovich because Shostakovich's music is anxious music. It's percussive and rhythmic and tense and seemed to suit the, her own emotional landscape. Um, but these two projects are very different. And we've been talking about community engagement. Both these projects were about community engagement. And I would suggest um, that the Second one, the archaeologist's wife, was structured in a way that delivered much, a much better standard of community engagement than the first. Um, although the first one probably reached more people. Uh, a learning curve, if you like, between the two. So um, to talk about the first one, we, um, we had um, a, the, we were funded by Heritage Lottery and also by the Arts Council. And their, um, their criteria for community engagement are remarkably similar, really. So we were looking for the same demographic. The opera was done in Merthyr Tidville, which is a community's first area, and an area of some deprivation in Wales. Um, we had um, a chorus. We had four professional, five actually, professional singers supporting a community chorus of about 12, 14 people. Um, these were students at Merthyr College. Uh, a lot of them were single mums. I think we only had two men, by the way, out of all that. They were, um, as always with community opera, you can carpet the floor with sopranos, but actually any other, <laughs> any other voice type is, um, is kind of a little uh, rare. But um, so they were, um, they were people who um, very typically represented the... Um, the demographic that um, Heritage Lottery and the Arts Council most wanted to reach. Uh, people on very low incomes, people who had um, started a foundation degree having previously been um, unemployed. And for some reason, they weren't the community. Uh, they weren't the community because they'd started doing a course. So despite the high dropout rate of people on this course at Merthyr College, <coughs> They're not the community. Um, 
Okay. Uh, we went on to uh, as we went on to also engage other uh, community groups. We had a group that was involved in writing the opera. Now I should qualify this and say that um, I don't mean people engaged in the editing process of creating the pasticcio opera, but people engaged in the libretto, the, the words, the dramatic structure and the narrative of it. So in order to make that open to people, um, I suggested to the community organization that we were working with that rather than have a situation where we've got to train people in how you write opera, we don't ask people to put words to notes. What we do is we discuss the emotional landscape of the opera, we discuss the dramatic structure and the content of the opera, and draw on their experience. But it was a salutary lesson that, um, although it was very hard to persuade the community organization that we were working with that it's quite a hard thing to write an opera, they weren't having any of that. They were convinced the community would flock to write an opera. In fact, it was very hard to find people to come and join an opera writing group. Extremely hard. Um, I went to, um, to meet a poetry group um, in a pub in Merthyr Tidville, um, because a lot of uh, librettos are, of course, in meter. I was heckled. I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> kind of, you know, it's a few years ago now. I'm getting over it. But anyway, it wasn't. It wasn't good. But um, in fact, we uh, had um, we had four people sign up to the um, to write the opera: a retired professor of anatomy, um, two local businessmen, and a published poet. And they were the community because they weren't doing a course. They weren't in education. So, um, so it, um, and we held up the rehearsals for four weeks while we, um, it, so I, I kind of feel that um, there were some core questions to be asked as a result of this project about who are not the community. Who, um, where do we draw the line between saying, this is, these people might fit the demographic that we want, but for one reason or another, something disqualifies them from being uh, accepted in the community. And these people are fine. And a part of it is um, the criteria both of the Arts Council of Wales and of Heritage Lottery are, I would suggest, in some ways, um, overly specific in these things. Yeah. Um, so that was a salutary lesson. When we started our second uh, opera, we, um, we had learned a bit from this, and um, we decided that what we would do is we would support professionals performing in the piece. So it would be written by professionals, and that allowed us to do something like work with Shostakovich rather than Handel. So it's a slightly more challenging piece in that way. Um, we, it then meant that the people writing the opera, the arranger and myself, I was the librettist, the, the, um, the people working on it, we could tailor the opera to the community participants. So we could find out who was going to be singing in it, find out their vocal ranges and their capacities, and, um, and tailor it to them. So there's less direct community engagement um, but at that level, but actually it, it facilitated more at the performance level. So we had, um, we had slightly more. We had about 15, 16 in this community chorus. Um, uh, again, all women, <laughs> with the exception of two men, and um, their, um, their level of engagement that they had was of a better quality, I would suggest, and um, it also allowed them to, um, to look outside the immediate performance and read quite a bit. So um, I, think, um, I think one of the gentlemen was talking about the things that people can do in community engagement other, other than the actual archaeology, and I think you mentioned field walking. Um, I would suggest one of the things that we found that um, one can do with the community very, very productively is um, the reading and research. Uh, there's an awful lot um, to be found in archives, and people can be taught how to use archives which does count as valuable worthwhile training to funders. Um, it means that having got the skill of knowing how to use an archive and how to read archaeological material, 
the lay person is then in a position where they can apply that to whatever project they personally want to do afterwards. So it is a skill with post-project um, mm -hmm. applicability. Um, we, found, um, we found in both our operas, we had to think quite carefully about the interface between art and archaeology. Um, they do different things, and negotiating where the line comes uh, requires some thinking about. Um, in the case of um, Anna Squidda, there's quite a lot of documentary evidence about the Sangors panel. It's um, uh, both contemporary evidence and later secondary source material. It's, there's a lot known. So it's easy to construct a narrative around it. But there are lacunae in the story. And we had to make some decisions about what to do there. Do you step in and do you um, fill in those? Or do you leave some things unknown? And I would suggest that opera is an ideal art form for that because it's an artificial way of telling a story in all sorts of ways. It's not naturalistic. And you see... Um, Purism, of both in history and in opera, are a kind of a, a dead end, if you like, in terms of community engagement. Um, we will never create an opera that will stand as a work of history, if you know what I mean. Um, but similarly, um, an archaeological report, no matter how beautifully written, is never going to be a work of art. Um, I would suggest <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to kind of qualify that straight away. And, um, and so, um, and in the sense that it's not a thing of entertainment, <laughs> I suppose. You know, um, and I, but I think it is possible with um, at the level of community engagement, it is possible to bring um, the two disciplines, if you like, of of art and history together. Um, at the interpretational stage, whereby the community participants go away with a very, very informed understanding of the interpretation of that particular site. It doesn't make them professional archaeologists, but it does mean that um, their engagement has brought them, um, <coughs> has brought their understanding far closer than it would be if you had simply picked off an archaeological report off a library shelf at random and flicked through it. It's, it is a real engagement. The reason why the arts make such a new vehicle, I think, for doing this, is um, they draw on, as I mentioned earlier, they draw on competen competences and expertise which community participants have anyway. And the, um, the art, I think, of community engagement is to draw on what people can do and what they can bring to the table, um, rather than ask them to go beyond, to go beyond that. I think that's as far as I wanted to go there. Um, so, yeah, any thoughts or questions from anyone? Yeah. Right, so a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs>